So I'm going to go out on a bit of a limb today. I'll talk about fish feelings, the neural basis of emotional states. And I think the story, the whole project is motivated by um, my attempt, the attempt of my lab to re reconcile the um, larval zebrafish, who is a vertebrate, a card carrying vertebrate, um, with sort of higher function that's usually only attributed to humans um, or um, at least higher mammals, and that's um, the uh, ability to have um, emotional states. It also um, harkens back a little bit to the age-old question whether fish can feel pain, and maybe at the end of my talk I can um, speak to that a little bit. Um, so that people worry about this a lot, right? Do they feel pain or not? And what does it even mean to feel pain? And can um, animals um, have emotions? And, and, and all of these um, things. And the, the, the uh, goal of today's talk and the project is to try to link sort of these higher levels of psychology with the low level mechanistic neural basis of, um, of, of, of circuits and behavior, the topic we usually work on. The hero of the story is Caroline Wee. You see the, the, her, her image here. She has moved um, since a while ago to, um, on to Singapore to have her own lab. But um, all the um, actual experiments and the neural data I'll share with you today um, are um, originating from her work, her PhD work um, in my lab, which was one of the most successful, full, um, as you'll see in a moment. I also should say that Caroline really, she really likes cats, so cats are going to be a, a red thread, a common theme throughout the talk. And here, this is not Caroline's image, but this is um, an image I'd like to introduce um, um, when I talk about the importance of internal states. And um, an internal state is something that um, reflects, is reflected by neural activity in the complete absence of um, explicit behavior. So um, there is sort of an old um, still resilient threat in, in neuroscience and behavioral ecology about behaviorism that the, the only thing that really counts in the end is the output of the animal, the behavioral output. It sort of harkens back to, to, to Skinner in some way, but I think Skinner is being given this credit. I think he thought much more deeply than that, that there's nothing more to say about the output of an animal than its behavior. I think he, he didn't really believe that either. Um, but this image here um, really illustrates the fact that a lot of stuff can go on in the brains of animals, even in the absence of any behavior. So if you just think about, wait a minute, let me, um, um, can you see my cursor? Yes, the arrow here, yes. Uh, so all of these German shepherds are being trained, um, the police dogs, they're being trained not to respond to this cat. And uh, we all know that a lot of stuff is happening in the um, brains of these dogs. They really, really want to kill the um, little bitch here. Um, and the cat also knows that you can tell by the expression in her face that she's completely um, immune to any attack because these are well-fed dogs. So lots of activity, lots of internal states in the absence of any behaviors. So I think um, it, it's just sort of a, a fun illustration that also has a cat in it. And you can see the cat really enjoys it. So here are um, the um, motivational states, um, sort of the four Fs that um, govern um, all of the drives in, um, in most animals. Four Fs are um, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and mating. Um, these are the um, sort of um, internal motivational states, which I think are related to feelings, and we will talk about almost all of them. Maybe not fighting, yes. <clears throat> but these ones um, we will address in the context of larval zebrafish. So um, that's another motivation for um, um, motivational and um, internal states. So examples of internal states, motivational states, are hunger, stress, pain, and loneliness. And those I will address. And um, I'll briefly talk about first a semantic issue, whether we should call these feelings. And then I'll talk about the philosophical issue briefly before I get into the neural data. Um, where I um, discuss um, how we know that any animal or agent or another creature has an internal motivational state, an emotion, a feeling or not. Right? What, by what criteria can we decide whether a larval zebrafish has a feeling 
or whether it's just a reflexive automated response. So there's two issues. One is semantic, the other one is somewhat uh, philosophical. And I'll go through those briefly. So I will talk today about loneliness in Lago Zebrafish. And I've caught a lot of grief for using the word loneliness. What people told me in order to get published and get funded and to avoid getting yelled at is I shouldn't call it loneliness because that's a, um, a term from human psychology and should not be applied to um, animals. I should call it an aversive internal state induced by social deprivation. Then people would be okay with that in a lot of zebrafish. Um, but I think that's sort of um, avoiding the central issue. Right? I think actually an aversive internal state induced by social de deprivation is something that we mean um, um, when we say loneliness. Is, uh, Similarly, one could argue that we shouldn't call it stress or pain in a, um, in a larval zebrafish, but an aversive internal state induced by a noxious insult. And also we shouldn't call it hunger, yes, um, but we should call it an aversive internal state induced by caloric deprivation. And I think the point I'm trying to make here, this is sort of arbitrary and semantic. And um, I like terms like hunger, pain and loneliness because they resonate with non-scientists as well. It, it, it's um, a useful term to talk to everyday people and I think it captures something that is, um, it's almost an abbreviation for um, these much longer, more scientific, jargony sounding terms here. So I'm, 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 not, I mean, I'm not completely dug in on using these terms in Lava Zebrafish, but I, I would prefer it. I think I, one can make a good case. Now, how do we know whether an animal has an emotional and, um, uh, or, or a machine even, if you want, an um, internal state? How do we quantify them? How do we know it is an internal state? And these are sort of three rules I've made up on the go. Um, and the first one, I think, is um, that the, there needs to be a control of the environmental context of the agent, of the creature, of the animal that you're studying. So um, the internal state needs to be um, in response to something, uh, to a change in the environment. Yes. An example would be noxious heat for stress. So if you heat the animal, then there's an internal state that try, that's trying and, and, and that, that, that's resulting in an avoidance of this. Um, if you uh, calorically de deprive the animal, if you food deprive it, then um, the um, um, they, they, it should induce um, an internal state that we can call hunger, um, and so on and so forth. Right? So one is that the, um, um, that the environment controls it. Right? This is not something that happens um, spontaneously and independent of environmental influence, but it's something that happens in response um, to the environment. And I think um, it should also um, have some adaptive um, feature attached to it. So I think most of these emotional, internal motivational states have evolved for a reason, namely to make the animal more adaptive. And I think that's um, um, linked to that. Yes. I should also say that these three points that I'm putting forth here are not, I don't think they're um, 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 sufficient really. They don't capture everything. Um, they are not um, um, yeah, uh, complete but they are, in my view, necessary. So I think you should um, have all three of these to some extent fulfilled in order to um, confidently claim that your animal or your agent has an, an internal motivational state. So one is in control of the environmental context. The other one is um, a behavioral readout. So ultimately, the behavior of the animal needs to change as a consequence of your um, emotional state. Um, you lower the threshold of escape behaviors for stress, you increase feeding for hunger. So um, these internal states need to ultimately result in a, in a change in the behavioral strategies. I think that's also a requirement, otherwise, otherwise they, they just don't make any sense and we shouldn't be allowed to call it such. And third, and I think that's probably where um, I can pacify a lot of the critics, is um, there should be also a relation to an internal neurochemical state. So, so some neuromodulator modulator like oxytocin and for stress and loneliness and mating behavior and serotonin for hunger. So um, there needs to be a, um, um, some neurochemical correlate that we can link it to. So I think those are the three um, aspects that I will discuss in larval zebrafish for um, um, loneliness and hunger. And um, you'll be the judge whether that's good enough to be able to call it um, a motivational or an emotional state. 
So um, I'll start with um, lonely fish. I, again, I caught a lot of grief for that, for um, calling it lonely. How can you say that? How do you know a fish feels lonely? Do fish have feelings at all? And then there's a question about how about feeling hungry? And again, I think um, you can call a feeling anything that um, in the human language is pre pre prefaced by the word I feel. Right? I feel hungry, I feel lonely, I feel pain, I feel, um, as long as you can say that and it makes sense in English, I think then, um, to me at least, it's an operational definition for feeling. So first of all, um, do fish feel hunger? Larva uh, fish. And that's not a trivial statement because um, um, it might be that they are actually not hungry, they just feed reflexively. Um, there's been some rumors that, that say that fish will just eat until they explode and until they die because they don't have a, a motivational drive. Um, so that's the, one of the first things we set out to test. Um, do fish, larva zebra fish, regulates their food uptake uh, depending on the um, caloric state. And uh, what you see here is uh, um, um, data from an experiment that Joshua Jordi in my lab did a couple of years ago, where he just quantified food intake in larval zebrafish, and he um, exploited the fact that larval zebrafish are perfectly translucent, and that we can color in the food, the paramecia, with a fluorescent dye. Um, if we do that, then every time a fish eats, takes a swallow of a, a paramecia and one bite, then the fluorescence in his gut goes up by one quantum level here. You see, you see the gut of a larval zebrafish swimming around and getting its gut getting brighter and brighter with every um, um, paramecia it swallows. We can do this with high throughput in a 96 well plate and we can collect these um, intake, intestinal food contact curves um, and what you see here, this is a fish that's been fed previously before we put it in the, in the chamber and the internal food content goes up slowly over 60 minutes. Um, if it's fasted for two hours, it goes up slightly higher and if it's fasted for four hours, it goes up much quicker. And what you can see here already is that not only does the rate of food intake um, go up, so they eat more quickly, they also eat a lot more. So the meal size um, um, can also be quantified. And as an additional benefit, we can even quantify the pooping here. It's a sort of the, the digestion, call it digestion. Right? So that's nice. That tells us that fish actually feel hungry. Hung, well, they, they respond as if they're hungry, if they're food, food deprived. And um, another, um, so this is sort of a behavioral um, strategy to measure um, 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 internal state of, of, of being hungry. And here is a neuronal state um, of um, measuring the, um, well, another internal state in all vertebrates. And this is related to the oxytocin cluster. Yes. You all have it, all mammals have it, zebrafish have it too. It's the oxytocin system. And you've probably heard a lot about this, about the cuddle hormone, the pregnancy hormone, the sex hormone. This is even being sold now. Oxytocin is being sold in um, dubious um, shops as a, a spray. You can spray into people's faces and they fall in love with you. Right? Makes you makes you just... Um, I think a, a lot of that is largely um, nonsense, but um, um, oxytocin clearly plays a role. It's a um, um, an important um, chemical that um, controls and regulates internal states in all animals. And we set out to um, test and measure what um, oxytocin activity looks like in a larval zebrafish. The advantage, again, of the larval zebrafish is that they, um, it's small, it's translucent, it is a vertebrate, so it has oxytocin neurons. Here's in the preoptic area. What you also have is a prominent cluster of oxytocin neurons and the posterior tuberculum here is another one. And this is all in the hypothalamus. This is a, um, a cluster that we can visualize by just making a transgenic animal where GFP is expressed in all of the um, oxytocin neurons. So they have them. Um, uh, next, what Caroline did is use a, a sort of a very rough um, um, way of doing calcium imaging in this um, um, particular, in this um, oxytocin cluster simply by doing phosphor, right? This is uh, um, um, something akin to immediate early chains where um, calcium activity will just um, enhance the expression of phosphorylated ERK. It's a, it's, a, it's a kinase, it's a MAP kinase, and that we can visualize with an antibody post-hop. So we can just ask um, how um, the activity, the calcium activity in the oxytocin cluster um, relates to um, internal states in the animal that we can induce 
by long-lasting behavioral, environmental and manipulations. This is, um, people ask, why don't you do two photon calcium imaging, brain wide imaging? You're famous for that. Well, the problem is if you head fix, head embed a larval zebrafish such that you can do brain wide calcium imaging, you already put him into an internal state that is not normal. We are not kidding ourselves, right? We realize that, that, that by head fixing um, or fully embedding um, an animal, you're not leaving it. Um, alone, right? I mean, you, you will influence its, its internal state. And the real advantage of the phosphor method is um, it's completely non-invasive and um, you don't even need a transgenic animal, right? All you have to do is, um, is catch the animal, kill it quickly, and then the phosphor ERK, the phosphorylated ERK, will give you an integrated record of the neural activity, probably of the last two or three or four minutes before the animal dies, so, which again has a poor temporal resolution. Um, but at least we know we haven't interfered in any way with the animal's internal state. So that's um, um, why this is useful. It also um, is a very simple, straightforward and high throughput technology. And it has, as you can see here, single cell resolution. So we can relate the phosphor signal back to the um, 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 individual neurons. And here's what Caroline found um, when we look specifically at calcium activity, neural activity, so integrated neural activity in the preoptic area, in particular in the um, um, uh, presumably um, um, uh, largely due to um, oxytonergic activity when we put the animal into different um, internal states. And the way we did that is uh, just using the sort of a rather crude um, way is we uh, used electric shocks to put them into a bad state. Yes, everybody can relate to that. Mustard oil is a somewhat toxic, abrasive um, um, chemical that burns them in a way. So this is like um, 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 an, an insult to a fish and they will escape to that. So um, then we have noxious heat, which is subjectively a little bit less bad than mustard oil or electric shocks. We have dish taps, which are just slightly annoying. We have the optomotor response, which is just showing them moving stripes and getting them to swim along. We should think that's a neutral stimulus. And then we were looking for two positive um, 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 context changes, like food and like cocaine. So we know this is a different story, but we know that fish do like cocaine. They, they, they can be conditioned, um, adult fish can be conditioned to seek co cocaine and um, larval zebra fish will swim up reliably um, um, on, a, on, a, on a cocaine gradient. So um, mean brain activity measured with phosphor ERK was, was a lot of variance here. Um, across these, uh, this gradient of, um, of state manipulations from, from worst to best. But what we found in the um, preoptic area is that there was a, a, a very strong correlation between the negativity of the stimulus and the activity um, in these neuronal clusters. Right? So this would suggest, at least, that um, oxytocin in the preoptic area, the activity correlates um, with a um, negative um, manipulation of the animal, and maybe even with a negative internal state. So um, Caroline went on to test this further. So if oxytocin activity really codes for um, a negative, aversive internal state, then um, we wanted to know what happens if you actually stimulated this. We use, um, I think this is one of my very few um, channel adoption slides here. Um, um, if you drive um, the, um, um, oxytonergic um, um, activity with, um, um, with channel adoption, um, what you can see is that indeed the animal will start responding with um, large animal tail flicks, which is an aversive um, a response to an aversive stimulus. It's an escape response. Yes, um, so here's a control fish that doesn't express um, channel adoption. And here we have a, a fish that is um, expressing channel adoption only in the oxytonergic um, 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 neurons. And you see that um, um, there are escape tail flicks here, but with a very long latency. So, so this is um, um, five seconds total here. So it's not that this is a sensory motor drive. It seems to be that the um, oxytonergic activity just um, um, up um, modulates um, the probability um, of um, an um, escape response here. So, so um, this is a response probability, which is going up with stimulus duration here, and the uh, response frequency is also going up, um, which is lacking in controls. And the um, latency 
is on the order of, um, of two seconds. Yes, yeah. For a two second stimulus and for a um, um, five second stimulus, um, it is the same. So this also um, sort of, sort of um, fulfills the third or the second requirement that oxytocin activity, if you are in a negative internal state, then um, um, you escape more. And um, this is a somewhat gruesome experiment here. Um, so Caroline could show that it is indeed the oxytocin, the, the agonist itself, by using a headless prepar preparation. So you just decapitate the fish and you just leave the hindbrain here. And then you simply pipe it oxytocin the agonist itself, so you're not driving neurons, onto this preparation. And what you can um, see here is that after um, a couple of minutes, presumably when the oxytocin um, um, penetrates into the strep to the relevant um, receptors, it elicits these extremely strong um, um, escape swims, even in the absence um, of a brain. Süddeutsche Zeitung, yes. All right. And here's an, um, a movie of that. Hope you can see it. So this is a headless fish, right? It's just a hind, hind brain. Um, oxytocin has been added, and now you can see that the fish is vigorously escaping um, just by the delivery um, of oxytocin. Presumably, I mean, the oxytocin neurons themselves have been removed here, and they are residing in the in the midbrain of the hypothalamus. But the receptors in the hind brain and the spinal cord are still there, and they presumably are eliciting these drug swims. So that's nice. So this, this tells us. Um, that um, oxytocin seems to be a, um, a system, um, an ancient system, that does not really um, enhance feeling good and cuddly and, um, and lovingly to our um, um, conspecifics, but it seems to be just a stress-related, uh, stress maybe an endorphin, something that, when activated, induces defensive responses. And we got, a, again, a lot of grief for that because it, it, it is in contrast to the, um, to the law, to the party line, right, where oxytocin is supposed to make you feel good. And my interpretation of this is that, um, I mean, if you look, read a little bit more carefully the mammalian literature on oxytocin, then um, you'll find that oxytocin gets released mostly during childbirth, during mating, and during nursing. Yes, sir. And I would argue that all of these are not happy events, but these are extremely stressful events, yes, sir, and certainly for females. And, um, and that what oxytocin might do is just a protective and, 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 and endorphin and a response um, to a stressful situation that allows you to cope um, 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 more adequately with it. Yes, sir. In the larva zebra fish, this is escape. In, in mammals, I don't know yet, in mice, in rats, or in humans, uh, what an adequate response is. But, um, but I think what um, oxytocin is, the ancient res um, 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 responsibility of oxytocin is really more a... a, a um, an endorphin that gets released during stressful situations. But of course, the jury on that um, is still out. So lonely fish, one of the other sort of Carolines, this was almost a serendipitous um, off chance discovery, is that um, fish raised in isolation eat less. Yes, and the way she discovered is that, um, and she, I think she had to um, raise fish in isolation for um, generating transgenic lines, and she found that they're just skinnier than the ones um, raised in, um, in, um, in with company. Um, and because, as I've told you um, 10 or 15 minutes ago, we have this quantification of um, this, this, this metric, this method for quantifying intake of food, so we can actually measure quantitatively um, how much a fish eat. And so it's a very simple experiment is you take one fish, or you take three fish, you um, um, keep them for two hours, either in isolation or with company, and then you add axis labeled fluorescent paramecia and you look at the fluorescence. And what you see in a single um, 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 experiment that um, fish raised in a group eat twice as much as fish raised in isolation. That's interesting. So I think it also argues for um, an internal motivational state that is modulated by something, in this case by um, um, the absence of conspecifics. And um, if we vary the group size between one, two, three, um, um, and five, we can see that the, the higher, whoops, sorry, the higher the, um, the group density, the more um, the fish eat. Of course, this saturates um, roughly at, the, um, at a factor of two. Yes. Now we wanted to know how does a larval zebrafish know that they're in a group? And because they're very visual animals, initially we thought 
it's a visual stimulus. Yes. So here's a um, 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 first experiment. You raise a fish in isolation, but with a glass wall in a glass cage, where it's surrounded by others. This is isolated, but has visual input. Or that was the alternative theory. Maybe they're not um, seeing the conspecifics, but they're smelling them. Right? And for that, what Caroline did is just took conditioned water from a, um, um, a dish where fish were swimming in a group and piped it back into the um, isolated, lonely fish. And she just wanted to, to know how much do they eat. Yes, sir. And this was quite remarkable, right? So again, we have isolated fish, fish in a group, they eat a lot more. If you uh, give them visual feedback, it doesn't really change much, right? I think it's, it's, it, it, there's no significant increase. But if you give them the odor, the, the conditioned water from other fish, then they um, eat a lot more, and this is even stronger for the pooled experiment here. So it seems that they're not seeing the other, that there seems that they're probably, they're, they're chemically sensing them, and we think it's a smell. They're smelling the others, they like sort of the stink of brotherhood, and that makes them happy. And if you deprive them of this smell, then they are lonely, they are sad, and um, as we'll see, probably oxytocin gets modulated, but not in the way that you think. It's not that oxytocin goes up when there is uh, conspecifics around, it's that oxytocin activity is being suppressed because remember, in larval zebrafish, oxytocin is not a feel-good hormone, it's a stress hormone. So, one other behavior that we needed to uh, get as, as a readout for loneliness, so one is they eat less, Another one, lonely fish seem to be more sensitive, more touchy, more jumpy in response to um, a, a noxious stimulus. And um, one way to um, deliver a noxious stimulus, which is not that easy, right? Quantify it, quantify it, and um, deliver a noxious stimulus. What Caroline did is not use shocks or heat or, or pain. She made use of the fact that uh, larval zebrafish also have a trip A1 channel, which is your, it's a vertebrate mammalian human, pain sensor, yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, on the surface of your periphery. If that gets activated, um, um, then you feel pain. And there is an agonist called Octobin, and you can um, cage it, you can use caged Octobin. And if you now uncage Octobin, um, which drives the trip A1 channel, then you can, um, in, a very quantified, uh, in a very quantified manner, you can inflict um, pain. And what you see is that um, if you take isolated fish, yes, sir, you shock them, you hurt them just a little bit, this is not very much, then they respond um, a lot, whereas um, fish who've been pre-exposed to a conspecific odor, who've been raised, um, so to speak, um, um, in a group, respond much, much less. And here's an, an, an example of that. Right? This is the tail angle and the um, 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 swim velocity of the fish. Um, so we can um, quantify in a way that fish who are um, um, in the presence of conspecifics are less sensitive to noxious stimuli, um, which again is something that of course is um, related to, or allows us to hypothesize about um, oxytocin activity. And this is now when we measure oxytocin um, um, activity in social isolation. So here's the ex M -M 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 experiment. This is a new neural recording, again, using phosphor erc, um, um, because we have want the fish to swim around freely um, in the presence of um, conspecifics or in isolation. And then we mapped oxytocin activity um, in the preoptic area here, and um, also in the um, posterior tuberculum. And what you can see, you remember the um, scaling of aversiveness that I showed you previously. This is electric shock, uh, so, uh, uh, this is electric shock here, this is mustard oil, this is noxious heat. These are all, I think, caught carrying aversive stimuli. This is dish taps, which are slightly annoying. And here we have the increased activity due to social isolation. And in a way, this allows us to quantify already how bad it is, a fish, it is for a larval zebra fish to be lonely or to be isolated. It's about between um, noxious heat and um, mustard oil, right? roughly here. So if you want to know um, um, how bad it is to feel um, lonely for a um, larval zebra fish, at least we can use these um, semi-quantitative um, p erg activity to gauge the, um, the feeling of um, uh, the, 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 the negative um, internal state, which I think is, um, is quite remarkable. That, that this um, readout, neuronal readout, um, already gives us a handle on, on, on a, um, a quantitative, semi-quantitative handle on the internal state. And here we have um, a, a 
the um, oxytocin activity now quantified on a cell by cell by basis. Um, we um, have um, electric shocks in mustard oil, which drive um, um, a lot of neurons to become active in the oxytocin clusters, both the preoptic area and the um, um, posterior tuberculum. We have heat, which is slightly less, taps, which is a lot less. And here we have isolated fish, um, and you can just see um, the number of newly activated neurons, um, um, certainly more than taps and um, akin to heat. And with odor, isolated with odor, um, this activity is um, remarkably reduced. Right? So odor indeed, but not visual information, can reduce this activity. Now, um, that's sort of the story on um, why we believe that oxytocin really is a central node for measuring any kind of, um, or representing any kind of negative internal state. Um, in terms of loneliness, the question still stands, um, are they really smelling it? Yes. Um, are they smelling the conspecifics or are they sensing them by some other way? And for that, Caroline went and um, started doing proper calcium imaging now um, in the olfactory bulb and as you'll see later also in the oxytocin cluster. And um, first of all, we convinced ourselves that, oxy uh, that olfactory neurons um, in the olfactory bulb um, indeed um, have some res um, specific response property to a conspecific odor. Yes, sir. So this is um, 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 the olfactory neuron clusters. Um, when we cluster the neurons according to their response profiles, we find one cluster that is specific to conspecific, another cluster that is specific to adult odor. And here I should say briefly, that adult odor or the presence of adults for a zebrafish baby is not something happy and nice. Um, one of the biggest, uh, most dangerous enemies of a larval zebrafish, of a zebrafish baby, are the parents. They will eat it. Yes. So um, adult zebrafish, as well as any other big fish, in a way, is the enemy. So adult, is, uh, adult zebrafish are a predator. Yes. So there's a different um, um, neuronal cluster in the olfactory bulb that codes for adult odor. Um, Another one codes for um, um, paramecia, and then we have one that just responds to just the presence of warmth. So there are specific clusters in the olfactory bulb. And um, then um, uh, Caroline looked in the oxytocin cluster, what those neurons do in response to these different stimuli. So in um, Yellow, we see a, a pooled response to um, conspecific odor. This is the um, smell that presumably that they like, and you see oxytocin activity is going down, whereas adult odor leads to an increase in oxytocin activity, which is consistent with the idea that this induces a, a negative internal state and induces um, 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 vivid um, escape responses in the larval zebrafish. The uh, theory or the hypothesis that um, comes about is that there is a, a cluster of inhibitory neurons somewhere, presumably driven by um, conspecific. We call it happy water, right? Conspecific water is happy water. It puts the fish at ease. Um, so um, inhibitory neurons somewhere that are driven by, um, by conspecific, by happy water, then inhibit specifically the um, oxytocin cluster. And here um, you just see a quantification um, of the experiment, how um, there's a large um, percentage of um, oxytocin neurons in the preoptic area that are indeed um, suppressed by the delivery of happy water, by the delivery of conspecific odor. This is 40% of the neurons in the preoptic um, cluster are inhibited, and only 13% of the neurons are um, enhanced. So it is not that simple, really, right? It is somewhat more complicated. I think oxytocin neurons code for many things. They're multidimensional. Um, there are also a few um, oxytocin neurons that will be driven by happy water, but the large majority um, is um, suppressed. This is almost reversed for adult odor. If you give adult odor, adult water, conditioned water, then you see a lot of 40% um, of the oxytocin neurons, and they're not overlapping um, um, with the ones that are uh, being suppressed here. Um, they're also not the same ones that are being enhanced by um, conspecific odor. So this is really a, um, a switchboard oxytocin that can take in a lot of environmental information and can presumably lead to a variety of um, um, 
modulation of output behavior here. Um, right. So this is the um, um, sort of summary um, 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 control experiments that went one step further of testing our theory that oxytocin indeed um, modulates zebrafish um, defensive behavior. And um, so what Caroline did here is to um, perturb, so you use sort of causal neuroscience, perturb um, the activity in oxytocin neurons and see what kind of behavioral effects we get. So this is again getting back to the um, food, right? And remember, um, we think that uh, if oxytocin neurons are activated, fish will not eat, presumably because the fish is now in a defensive position where um, his whole brain circuitry is optimized for escape and not for, um, for eating. So the hypothesis is that um, oxytocin activity correlates inversely with the intake of food. So the experiment here was done by um, and what happens if we ablate um, oxytocin neurons with MTC. This is a, a, a chemical that we can use combined with a transgenic to specifically um, kill the oxytocin neurons. And um, what we find, again, this is the control um, where there is no um, chemical has been added. Um, again, lonely fish eat less. Um, fish raised in or, or um, um, who, who spend some time in a group um, eat twice as much. If we um, isolate, the, if we ablate the um, oxytocin neurons, then the group fish um, eat just as much as the isolated one. And um, the um, um, isolated fish, uh, well, sorry, sorry, the isolated fish um, will eat just as much as the group fish. Right? So what this argues is that it is indeed the um, oxytocin activity that prevents the fish from eating. So if we ablate them, fish, even if they're isolated, will eat just as much. Um, this is a different way of ablating the neurons with Botox. Um, you've all heard of that, and um, we get the same results. Fish raised in isolation will eat um, just as much if we specifically ablate these oxytocin, oxytonergic uh, neurons. Um, a, Last sort of um, equivalent to an um, um, ablation experiment is um, deliver an antagonist. Here the um, experiments become a little bit more dirty because pharmacology is never that specific, but Caroline did it anyway, and the results at least are perfectly consistent with our hypothesis. So if you use an antagonist to oxytocin, um, then again we get the same as the ablation results um, if we antagonize now the ox oxytocin receptor, not the um, activity in the oxytocin neurons. Um, we again see that isolated fish um, eat just fine. There might even be some um, um, room here for, I mean, if you could show that that's the same in, in people. Um, so if you don't want to eat, maybe just get rid of the oxytocin activity. But I'm not sure that there's really a, um, um, some clinical application. Yeah. And finally, the uh, Agonist, there's also an agonist with a long complicated name where you can drive um, the receptors, oxytocin receptors, and what you can see that even in a group, fish will eat much less. So all of this is consistent. I'm, I'm not saying we've proven it, but I think it really links together the um, activity of um, oxytocin, which is a conserved ancient neuromodulator that we all have, um, to um, appetite and also to generally defensive um, responses um, when the environment changes in a, in a negative way. Right, so this brings me to the end of the um, first part of the talk. I have 10 more minutes um, on hunger, the regulation of hunger um, in, in Lago zebrafish. So far, I've mostly talked about um, loneliness and, 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 and painful stimuli. Um, but um, from right. Alex Jordan, who says, hey, Alex, later you'll have to show me how to do a double spin and then kick <laughs> people in different um, directions. Is this aversive response driven by assessment that being alone is a more risky scenario than being in a group and hence stressful? If so, this is more like a fear response than loneliness. Right, right. I think, again, I think we get into semantic issues, right? If you are um, feeling uncomfortable because you're lonely, then there is one aspect whence this discomfort, right? I think we, we think that, um, so 
the ultimate reason why fish don't want to be alone, I think is indeed because they are more safe in a group. So I think um, a lot of the um, adaptive evolved behaviors in larval zebra fish make sure that they stay in the same place and in a group. Um, so this makes them survive. And I think this is just an, um, an evolved tribe that they have. Um, reflexes that make them um, um, enhance the probability that they stay in a group. As a, um, whether the, you, you want to call it fear of being attacked, if you're lonely, I think it gets into a deep philosophical and semantic um, debate again. Yes. So um, I think we talk later, but yeah, I think there's an, a, a very important discussion to have about a sort of reflective emotional state. I am alone and I don't like that. Yes. As opposed to I am alone and that's in itself not a problem, but the increased risk that that uh, is suggests or that that signifies or indicates is aversive. So um, I think that is something that is probably exclusive to humans with really higher cognitive reasoning capacities, right? Sure. That you think you're not afraid because I think if you think about it, if you're walking alone through a graveyard so, at night, then you would reason that you're not afraid for unspecific reasons of being alone, but because you're afraid that some um, burglar or murderer will jump out behind the tree and kill you. So that's sort of the reflective um, aspect of being afraid when you're walking alone in the dark in the woods. Um, I would argue that this reflective aspect is a cortical phenomenon that comes much, much later in evolution and even in our psyche. I think we're first afraid and we don't even know why we're afraid and then the cortex tells us why we are actually afraid because there's danger out there and it all makes sense. Maybe another really good example is the, um, <laughs> is the, uh, the, uh, the fear of getting infected with COVID right now, right? I think that's also um, sort of a, a rational construct of our cortex, much, much more than an internal um, state of being afraid. Or maybe something that um, is, is less provocative is the um, widespread fear of New England people of sharks now. Yes, because one person or two people got attacked, one person got killed by a shark last year, and now everybody is dead afraid of sharks. I would argue this is not, um, it has nothing to do with the rational fear of getting attacked by a large fish. It's a visceral response of our body that the cortex then um, later for us makes sense. I think for a larval zebra fish, it probably, or for any other animal than a human, and maybe even for humans themselves, it doesn't even make all that much sense to distinguish between the two. Like the, the difference between afraid because I'm lonely and I might get attacked versus the, the I'm just afraid because I don't like being lonely. Right? That's the difference you're talking about, right, Alex? Yeah, and I think it has a lot to do with social transmission of, of information and, and sure. gauging, gauging a, a risk or a landscape of fear based on the absence, presence, behavior, responses of, of other individuals or, or either other sources of information. But yeah, Good. we're getting way off topic. So okay. let's chat about it later. Let's talk about eating. Yes, sir. Yeah. Five more minutes. I'll try to be quick here. Yes, sir. Eating and hunger. Here cats again. Uh, so I think I've made the point that the... So um, um, I just, yeah, I'll try to keep this brief, but I think um, it's about the relationship between serotonin um, in, um, and, and hunger. And um, the brief version of the story is that until quite recently, there's been very conflicting um, uh, results in the literature, mostly derived from um, experiments in mice, but also in, in, in people, about how serotonin relates to hunger. And the, uh, um, some of the uh, literature will tell you that um, when serotonin goes up, hunger goes down. You find a lot of that. And another, um, um, part of the literature will tell you that um, serotonin correlates positively with hunger. So the more serotonin activity you have, the more hungry you are. And um, this really has not been resolved and Caroline resolved it. And I'll, I'll tell you the story. What's the difference um, between, um, yeah, how serotonin can, when it goes up, how increased serotonin activity can both increase you being hungry or also um, decrease your, your feeling of hunger. 
And um, again, we are back to the hypothalamus. That's also the home of the oxytocin neurons. And it is really the hub, the center of all um, neuromodulatory activity, I think in all vertebrates really. So there's lots and lots of neuromodulatory substances, which are all conserved. I mean, this is nice about this whole story that zebrafish and mammals and humans are um, really using the same hardware, neuronal hardware to, um, um, to modulate um, activity in the rest of the brain. Um, it is highly conserved. I've said this already. Here is the um, hypothalamus in larval zebrafish, where it is rather large compared to um, what you find in, um, in mammals. And there's the caudal hypothalamus here, medial lateral hypothalamus, and the lateral lateral hypothalamus. Um, maybe just remember the lateral and the caudal one. This is going to be important um, because um, here, uh, yes. And um, again, this is uh, about appetite, serotonin in this case. Um, and here are all the people who were um, involved. And um, again, it is about an internal state, um, is how hungry do you feel? And um, the uh, um, behavior we are looking at is in, in you have external food, food cues, and then we either get consumptive behavior if you're in a low cal caloric state. So this is a cat that's being hungry, it will eat the mouse. And here's a cat. This is not a hungry cat. This is sort of a satiated cat, right? And it's sort of... <laughs> doing a half-assed job at, at, at trying to get at this. So what is the difference in internal state between those two cats? One that um, is just looking, the other one is. So. And um, in a nutshell, what Caroline found is, of course, not of course, but remarkably, um, also in a larval zebra fish, it is linked to um, um, serotonergic activity in the caudal hypothalamus. And here, this is using phosphor, but also calcium imaging, are the um, activity curves that Caroline found. So first, if you um, increase, if you st starve, if you fast the fish, then serotonergic activity in the caudal hypothalamus is going up. This is consistent with half of the party line. Yes. Half of the people think that, of course, serotonin, more serotonin, the more hungry you are. And so if you, if you um, give, um, 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 if you starve the animals, um, serotonin, serotonergic activity is going up. And um, in the lateral part, the green part, this um, contain of the hypothalamus, lateral, it does not contain serotonergic neurons, but glutamatergic neurons. And there we see that activity is going down, so they seem to be anti-correlated. So far, I'll just present these um, 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 as, as, as findings, as data. Now, um, here was a remarkable finding. The moment you present food, you do not actually start feeding them. They're not eating, they're just seeing the food, yes, sir. Um, the instance they're exposed to food cues, serotonergic activity drops way below baseline levels. Yes. So there's something about the sensory input of the cue, of the food cue, that seems to block serotonergic activity entirely. And this is sort of consistent with our um, um, idea that these two neuronal groups um, are mutually inhibitory, so they inhibit each other. And um, this will relieve inhibition from the glutamatergic neurons, and they will go up now. And what we hypothesize is the strong drive in glutamatergic neurons will actually drive for a voracious feeding. But now see what happens. When the animal is now eating and presumably getting less and less hungry, serotonergic activity is um, increasing again. And you see how this is sort of beautiful, right? It tells you that... Um, when the animal is getting hungry and hungry in the absence of food, it correlates with serotonergic activity. Then, when it's exposed to food, so in the presence of food, right, um, serotonin correlates with satiety. So, and I think that is um, interesting for two reasons. One, it sort of resolves almost the issue that serotonin can correlate both with being hungry and with being satiated. So there's a positive correlation here and here. If you don't look at the switch, you will never notice, right? You, here, you see a positive correlation between serotonin activity and being satiated. The more you eat, the higher the activity. Here, um, if you don't know the baseline levels, right? Here, you see that the more, you, um, the more hungry you get, the higher the serotonergic activity is. But even more importantly, I think this actually um, reflects a, uh, a different internal state. Being hungry in the absence of food 
is very, very different internally than being hungry in the presence of food. Being hungry in the presence of food, I would argue, is a positive internal state. It's also the um, adaptive behaviors when you're in the presence of food is very, very different than the adaptive behavior when you're hungry in the absence of food. So, hungry in the absence of food means you need to hunt. So, hungry in the presence of food means you need to forage, you need to graze, you need to eat. So what I think what serotonin is doing is um, it's in the absence of food, it will drive exploratory um, behavior. It drives exploration. In the presence of food, serotonergic activity um, um, will um, suppress, well, so if there's no more drive for exploratory behavior, you suppress um, exploratory behavior and you enhance now exploitative, ex exploitation behavior. And all of you who have children, I think, have um, encountered this really annoying um, problem that if they just don't want to eat this, uh, even if they might be hungry, right? So certainly, I, I, I think um, 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 this one, um, if you're in this state here, in, in, the, in the hungry, in the absence of food, you don't eat, yes? You're suppressing eating behavior, you look for exploratory behavior, yeah? The moment you um, get exposed, then this activity should get suppressed. But if it's not, if this circuit is not yet active, what you will do is you will keep hunting, you will keep exploring, you will keep looking around, and you will not stop and shut the fuck up and eat. Yes. This, I think, also happens sometimes in predators. Yes, sir. If a predator is in hunting activity, yes, sir, it might remain there. It gets bloodthirsty, it will just keep killing and keep hunting and will not um, um, exploiting and eating. And this can be very, very maladaptive because um, if you're a tiger or uh, another hunter and you've made your kill and the food is now, um, you get food cues, but you keep hunting, then your food source will probably um, um, get um, 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 stolen and removed by, 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 other, um, um, by other predators. So I think the switch from exploratory, from hunting activity to exploitatory grazing activity is absolutely essential. It's an adaptive thing for any predator. So I think cows won't have this, tigers will. And um, the question is, why do we believe that larval zebrafish are rather tigers than, um, than cows? And I think um, the remarkable thing about larval zebrafish is they can switch. They can switch between um, a defensive exploratory um, mode where they're just running away from predators, but then they can actually switch into predatory mode where they converge their eyes, start hunting, and, um, and, and start looking for food. And I think this is exactly what's happening, is this, um, this remarkable switch from explo exploration to um, exploitation. And um, again, we can use um, 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 a variety of, in this case, it is um, optogenetic um, perturbations where we can um, activate the serotonergic neurons now because we have a molecular genetic handle on the ser serotonergic neurons. And um, what um, is shown here, is again that the feeding response um, in, um, in fish that express the reacher, this is a, um, a, again a, a channel rhodopsin derivative. Um, there's another one who wants to get admitted. Um, that um, we can um, increase the um, food consumption if we um, activate serotonergic activity um, 30 minutes before feeding. Yes, sir. Um, However, during feeding, yes, if we um, activate serotonergic activity during feeding, feeding it actually reduces um, the food intake. Yes, sir. And that I think sort of is a, again, is a suggestive, it's no proof, it's a suggestive um, 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 bit of information that argues that we might be on the right track here. Um, if we ablate serotonergic, serotonergic neurons altogether, then the idea would be that we are now constantly sitting in this um, state down here where the animal will not feel hungry, but whenever it is getting exposed to food, it will be um, um, compelled to eat a lot. And that's exactly what we find. Yes, sir. So if we ablate these neurons, these serotonergic neurons, either with um, 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 laser ablations or with um, MTC controls, then they will eat just a lot more. Even fat fish will keep eating and food deprived fish will eat a lot more. And I think uh, with that, I'll end. Um, I think this is just a very um, um, appealing and intriguing example of how a group of neurons, in this case serotonergic neurons, not oxytocin as shown previously, um, 
regulate hunger, but not in a simple um, dial up or dial down way. They regulate the feeling of hun hunger in a way that depends on the presence or absence of food cues. So meaning um, um, in the absence of food, serotonin uh, makes you feel hungry yes, and um, makes you look for food. In the presence of food, right, it stops the exploratory behavior and allows the rest of the system to engage in, in feeding behavior here. Right? It releases here the um, ability to feed and the hunger state then will drive serotonergic neurons up, probably some glucose metabolism um, effect, such that this um, um, relief, this release of the feeding state gets more and more uh, relaxed until the animal just doesn't care. Satiety means you just don't feel like it. Um, so that's sort of the cartoon that uh, Caroline drew. And I think with that, yes, I um, summarize here again, hunger with and without food are different brain states that may drive distinct behaviors. Yes, um, hunger with no food is exploration. It suppresses actually consumption and feeding. And hunger in the presence of food cues will um, um, use, use to uh, consumptive behaviors. With that, I'll um, stop. I'll thank you all for your attention. And most of all, I want to thank Caroline for her um, um, contributions. I mean, she did all the work. Um, um, and I'll be happy to take questions. So we have a question from Hannah Williams. Sorry if confusing. If lonely and physical pain fear both increase oxytocin, is there an interactive effect? E.g., is the negative feeling of loneliness decreased if being social exposes you to the physical pain others may experience? Oh, yes, that's an excellent question, Hannah. Um, not in larval type of fish. I don't, I don't know. That's actually something we haven't tested yet. There is, so if, if, you, if you have a fish watch another fish, being obviously in pain, I don't think they will care much. But there is one aspect. Well, unless they're damaged, unless they're damaged. No, exactly. There is, um, so there is one interesting aspect. So um, it's Carl von Frisch, the guy who maybe you know um, from the honeybee experiments, remarkable stuff, also has discovered that um, fish, when they get attacked, um, injured, will release a substance called Schreckstoff that the mostly German speaking audience here will understand instantly. So they release it, it this. Translates the scary stuff. In scary English, stuff. Which we, find, <laughs> which we in English is even funnier. Um, so then fish will freak out and, and show, if you want, empathy. And really philosophical, interesting question is does this count, right? If fish get scared because other fish get injured, but it is sort of just in response to a, a olfactory cue that makes them scared, then I think. Um, it almost gets back to Alex Jordan's question previously, right? If I'm afraid, because I know that if I'm lonely, I might get attacked more, and that's why I'm afraid. Um, does this count more? Is this more important than if I'm just afraid because it smells like being afraid here, or because it's dark, or because there's nobody around me? Is there? I think this, this ultimate feeling that you all know, right? It's this sort of this unspecific sense of being afraid. I think that is something that larval zebrafish have, if in this case they don't smell happy water, but if they smell scary stuff, if they smell Schreckstoff, yes, they certainly, and we haven't done this yet because larvae don't respond all that well to, to Schreckstoff. It's more like juveniles and adults. But one really good experiment would be to expose larvae to Schreckstoff, to a scary stuff, and see whether oxytocin activity would go up. And I think then it almost fulfills um, Hannah's requirements that they, um, um, that they um, are socially exposed to the suffering of others. Do you think that such dysregulated serotonin actions you describe contributes to the rise in obesity or metabolic disease in humans? Why do you think animals get stuck in the, quote, bloodlust? Yeah, they're two different, they're both really good questions, right? Um, um, yes, I think so. I think that the, um, what we show in the, in the zebrafish, or at least we can hypothesize, that the, um, the sudden decrease in serotonergic activity releases, opens a gate, for um, reflexive consumptive behavior. So if you, if you see food and you're not controlled by the serotonergic activity, you will just keep eating. So in, a larval, in a healthy larval zebrafish, uh, what will happen is that the increase in caloric intake will drive up the serotonergic, serotonergic activity 
until it suppresses again this um, consumptive drive. And, and this might very well happen in humans as well, right? If, if this gate of, uh, of um, leaving this, this drive to eat, this reflexive response to food use, if that just stays open and doesn't get closed again, you will just keep eating as long as there's food, right? And, um, and I think in, in also in humans, um, um, serotonin might actually play a role like that. And there is a lot of evidence. The problem with humans is that serotonin doesn't just act in the caudal hypothalamus. You have serotonin everywhere in the brain and it's doing everywhere really important, interesting stuff. So interfering with serotonin activity or with serotonin receptors is really thorny. It's a complicated issue. Yeah? You can't just give somebody a pill that reduces serotonin -like activity and hope that they will um, stop eating because it will fuck up a lot of other um, neuromodulatory um, 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 circuits, feedback circuits in the brain. Um, the blood loss in animals, I think that's exactly what is happening. Is, 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 is again, is in this case, so I would say that the hunting and the killing is part, even in humans, is this drive to hunt, the thrill of the hunt, has nothing to do with appetitive, with consumptive behavior. It's an independent drive for gathering, for collecting, for hunting, getting access to food. And I think that is driven by very high serotonergic activity. So in larval tibra fish, certainly. This might also be true in ferrets, mostly in predatory animals. And if that switch doesn't happen, if the gain, the power of the food cubes, right? is not strong enough to make the switch, to shut off the serotonin, you will just stay in this killing frenzy. And I think that's what happens if you release a fox or a, a weasel into a hen house. Very good. Okay. Stephanie, do you, want yes, read, do you want to read the text? Great talk. You said oxytocin can be seen as a type of endorphin released to help cope with childbirth mating and breastfeeding. Yes. If it is a type of endorphin, then shouldn't oxytocin feel good? Yeah, well, sure, yes. It should, it should feel good, yes. I follow that oxytocin is released during aversive events in the zebrafish, but do you think that the oxytocin makes them feel good too, like an opioid? Yeah, or is it simply an internal cue for the fish that something aversive is happening? Well, I think we are getting again, this is the core, right? This is the philosophical issue of how do you know that something feels good, right? I mean, you might even, if you want a, a real brain teaser, is think about the computer or machine, like the Roomba or your Siri, right? When, um, when are they happy? When do they feel good? So, so um, well, in, in a nutshell, I think actually, yes, if oxytocin gets released, it makes you feel good. I think that is true. I think that's, that's what you see. That's for all other endorphins, right? But the... Um, the reason why it feels good right, for humans is because um, it serves to attenuate a uh, aversive negative stimulus. It allows you to ignore the pain. And maybe endorphins, what, what we think feeling good is ultimately is just the removal of pain. And again, this is a philosophical debate, right? If you bang your head against the wall, right? Does it really feel good if you stop? Yeah? Is that what you mean by feeling good? Because I think that's really what it is for oxytocin, right? Is that suddenly you can cope with the pain and arguably it feels good, right? If the pain goes away, but that's not really um, probably what you mean or what we mean. And I think that it just gets really thorny and sketchy, right? It's, it's because we are entering a realm of human psychology and philosophy rather than sticking to um, sort of behavioral readouts and adaptive evolutionarily controlled um, strategies that an animal develops. I think that's what, what makes this difficult. So I think, yes, it probably feels good to a fish um, if oxytocin gets released the same way that it feels good to you when you suddenly um, stop um, um, hurting you. A few for the fish, the aversive is happening. Just as a note, while zebrafish may not respond to aversive observed scenarios in social partner, wait, wait, Alex Jordan. Just as a note, while zebrafish may not respond to aversive observed scenarios in social partners, cichlids do show, oh yeah, no, no, I know, there's many, especially adult, I see also adult zebrafish um, 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 have a lot of these um, social interactions. Female genomic response to mate information, oh yeah, no, 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 yeah, no, very good, thank you, Alex. From Stephanie to everyone, thanks. I see your point. I'll bang my head against the wall and I think, what? <laughs> Very good, yes. 